Hi, everyone, and welcome to session two of the third iteration of the Massively Open Online course for the Digital Currencies Master's Degree at the University of Nicosia. This is Andreas Antonopoulos, and I'll be answering your questions as posed from the forums in advance of this course, as well as any questions that come up during this session in the chat room. So uh, just remember for next time, please uh, study the materials in advance and pose as many questions as you can in advance. Give your colleagues a chance to discuss and review these questions in the forums, and then we'll answer them at the end of the week with a live video session. Uh, and then, of course, when you join us on the live video, please ask more questions, um, but as many questions as possible in advance. So we're talking about consensus algorithms and the business time generals problem. And let's see these questions. All right. Sean asks, uh, in the previous MOOC, you mentioned a few times that Bitcoin's consensus algorithm is the only one we know that can scale. What other consensus algorithms do you think have the potential to scale, if any? Um, that's, a, that's a really difficult question, because potential to scale, I, I think, um, many of the consensus algorithms have potential to scale, uh, but potential to scale doesn't translate to actual scale. So it really depends on what we mean by scale. So let me just clarify. First of all, Bitcoin's consensus algorithm has scaled in practice to um, be able to support a security infrastructure that can resist attacks on a global scale to evaluation of uh, transactions and, and total market value of somewhere between two and a half and ten billion dollars. So that's what we know. That is a fact. But Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm not sure where we got cut off. So uh, if you could please let me know what was the last thing you heard. Okay, so we were talking about scaling of consensus algorithms, and uh, Bitcoin has scaled to a certain level. So what do we mean by scale in a consensus algorithm? There, there's a couple of different aspects to this. The, the first one is looking at the performance of the network and the performance of the consensus algorithm in the network in terms of throughput and performance in transactions per second, in the number of nodes that can connect, in the number of 
participants in the network, et cetera, et cetera, all of the parameters of performance that we're looking for. Um, and the second part of that is whether the security provided by the consensus algorithm can resist attacks against the network, uh, attacks that are motivated by an economic incentive to disrupt activity or to uh, cause problems with the network in general at a monetary scale. So, uh, for example, we can say that the Bitcoin consensus algorithm and the Bitcoin network um, scales to a level where it is able to process anywhere from two to seven transactions per second um, for one megabyte blocks uh, with uh, several thousand uh, participating nodes and with a certain level of hash rate. But we can also say that the Bitcoin consensus algorithm scales to a level of security that can resist denial of service attacks, that can resist um, mining compromise consensus attacks and can protect a total market valuation of anywhere between two and a half and ten billion dollars. So those are the two aspects of consensus algorithm scale. And um, you can simulate certainly uh, aspects of performance of a cryptocurrency, a blockchain or a consensus algorithm. However, it's not, it's not possible to simulate the adversarial environment of security where we're looking to see if uh, a consensus algorithm can resist attacks when the attackers are sufficiently motivated by the economics of the system. Um, given that Bitcoin's uh, consensus algorithm has not been successfully compromised by a consensus attack uh, at the current hash rate, that means that it can resist and provide security for a network of somewhere between two and a half billion and ten billion dollars in total market capitalization. Uh, and so we can say that it scales that much. What other algorithms can scale? We don't know yet. Uh, there are certainly many interesting consensus algorithms that provide differing levels of security. Uh, recently, one of the ones that has been bootstrapping fairly rapidly is the uh, consensus algorithm used in Ethereum. And so we're seeing that uh, develop uh, quite significant hash rates. Uh, I believe it's, it's already surpassed um, the hash rate of Namecoin, um, and it's on track to surpass or may have already surpassed the, the hashing rate of Litecoin. And um, so that, that provides us with uh, verification that that algorithm is scaling pretty fast and it's providing security for a network that is, uh, has a certain economic value. Um, now, what are the consensus algorithms? We do know that some consensus algorithms have not scaled very well uh, and the corresponding networks have not been resistant to attack. For example, recently um, we've seen uh, Namecoin um, suffer from a situation where more than 60% of the hash rate was controlled by a single pool that was doing merged mining. And this prompted uh, a number of platforms using Namecoin to reconsider that choice. Uh, specifically, uh, one of the platforms using Namecoin migrated to use uh, Bitcoin's chain instead because the uh, amount of hashing power concentrated in the hands of one miner uh, showed that Namecoin was not resistant uh, potentially to consensus attacks. Uh, and so Namecoin failed to scale. Uh, but the, the actual consensus algorithm used in Namecoin is the same one as in Bitcoin. And so it's not the consensus algorithm that failed to scale, it's the interest in the economic structure of that blockchain that failed to scale. And as the mining industry, if you like, that was dedicated to Namecoin did not scale. So there's several aspects of scale when it comes to consensus algorithms. You're looking at network scale, you're looking at the uh, industrial scale of the uh, mining infrastructure behind that, if it's dependent on mining uh, or other functions, if it's dependent on something else. Like for example, a proof of stake algorithm would have different dependencies for scale. Um, let's see. So I'm going to go through the prepared questions and then we'll go to questions in the uh, chat room unless we have some immediate follow-ups for the discussion we're just having. 
Simon asks, uh, how will the potential maximum block size increase affect scalability of uh, Bitcoin? Oh, well, that's a, a matter of much speculation. Um, arguably, increasing the limit on the block size will allow Bitcoin to handle more transactions per second. That's a simple fact. Uh, whether that will change the um, equilibrium or dynamics of the mining industry, uh, centralization in that industry, um, the uh, use and deployment of full nodes, nodes that keep a complete copy of the blockchain, or uh, have other ripple effects in the rest of the um, economic structure in the dynamic algorithms that are balanced at equilibrium in the uh, in the in the system that makes up Bitcoin, whether that's the difficulty algorithm um, and and various other uh, aspects of the Bitcoin ecosystem. We don't know that yet, so that's a matter of uh, much discussion and much contention at the moment. But certainly, uh, on a factual basis, if you increase the maximum block size, that means you can put more transactions per block, which means more transactions per second. Uh, through the Bitcoin network. So it will affect the underlying performance characteristics of Bitcoin. Um, and the argument really is at what cost and what the other side effects will be. Um, Sean writes, uh, in the previous MOOC session 7, we talked about learning from the stress tests that were occurring on the network at the time. Have we got any new learnings from stress tests since then? I think probably the most uh, consistent result we can glean from the stress tests is that, um, uh, that the Bitcoin network as a whole uh, was very resilient to basically an enormous increase in the number of transactions queued up for processing. And I know that in, in several cases, uh, individual nodes that uh, were installed and running and maintained by various parties may have suffered short-term interrupt interruption. So for example, um, my, the Bitcoin nodes that I was running, as well as uh, various overlay services like an insight service that I run, uh, in order to index the blockchain and provide it in, through an API. Uh, those services, when uh, stress tests, when faced with a very large number of uh, unconfirmed transactions, um, crashed. So I had um, my Bitcoin nodes run out of memory and my Insight nodes run out of memory. And as a result, I had to make some upgrades to the servers in order to be able to handle greater capacity of transactions. Uh, this is probably a good thing because it, it, it showed certain weaknesses. And you want those uh, crashes to happen um, in small parts of the network uh, during a, a time of load that is not persistent so that you can fix those and move on. But as a whole, the network uh, suffered really no interruption. Everything was queued up and then processed eventually in the order it came in and prioritized by transaction fee. So the network worked exactly as it should and handled the a uh, burst of uh, demand quite comfortably through all of these stress times, uh, all of these stress tests. There was essentially no network outage. There were just um, delays, and those delays were uh, dependent upon the fee that you paid in order to prioritize transactions. So the network handled it pretty well. Milton asks, um, Hi Andreas, you've referenced the Internet's trajectory as a model for Bitcoin in multiple ways. Rate of adoption, accessibility, anti-fragility, sense of resistance, early underestimation by experts, data throughput, etc. Uh, do you think this also applies to governance so that we'll have Bitcoin versions of the W3C, uh, the Internet Society, ICANN, IETF, IRTF, and various other standards? Or is the open so software governance model pioneered by Linux more applicable, where a core group of developers keep making most of the decisions? That's a really good question, Milton. Um, and I think uh, that's where we're going to see one of the biggest differences. A lot of things have changed since the early 90s when uh, the internet was growing up. And at the time, open source software was still in its infancy. I think um, we're going to see a hybrid of uh, three different models of governance. Uh, 
the first one is a, a traditional uh, governance, a hierarchical governance model by committee, which you see through ICANN and IETF. And I, I think we're already seeing uh, efforts to that um, in, in that direction. Uh, the MIT's Digital Currency Initiative, the recent uh, Scaling Bitcoin Conference, uh, the recently announced peer-reviewed technical journal Ledger, uh, and various other efforts in that direction will offer uh, a formal and structured mechanism for governance. Of course, uh, Bitcoin is uh, driven by voluntary association and choices made by all of the participants. So, um, one of the big differences is that uh, where in the early internet a lot of these governance models were binding uh, and uh, could make decisions and those decisions were enforced on the internet, uh, it's, it's hard to see how um, any hierarchical institutions that are developed uh, for governance in Bitcoin can be anything other than advisory and voluntary. Um, the second governance model, of course, is the open source governance model. And since the early internet, we've seen that model develop uh, dramatically with Linux and, and many other open source ecosystems. And today we have a much more vibrant governance model uh, concentrated around systems such as GitHub uh, and other collaborative software management tools. But uh, really this era of open source collaborative software has introduced a completely new way of doing governance. And then there's a little catch. And the catch is that Bitcoin is the first consensus-driven development system. So um, the, 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 the thing about Bitcoin that's different from Linux and different from the internet is that uh, the ability to run uh, diverse software is constrained by the requirements to meet the consensus rules. And until now, those consensus rules are closely tied to the reference implementation so that Bitcoin Core is the definition of what the consensus rules are. And those consensus rules were, uh, until very recently, spread across the entire code base of Bitcoin Core. Now, in the last uh, year and a half or so, there's been an effort to concentrate all of the consensus-related rules into a single library that can do transaction and block validation on its own. And this is called libconsensus. And the goal here is to modularize and separate all of the consensus sensitive um, code into a single library so that uh, changes to consensus are clearly differentiated from changes to all of the other software that runs in Bitcoin Core. Um, this actually offers uh, an opportunity for developers building other libraries that are uh, essentially uh, implementing the Bitcoin protocol and the Bitcoin consensus rules to have a stable reference implementation for the consensus rules, which can lead to more diversity of software. Uh, but still, this is open source with a twist. It's open source, but the outcome of the open source depends on in-network runtime consensus implementation. So there's the consensus rules um, as defined by standard or committee, uh, what we uh, believe or we agree as consensus rules in terms of standards, and that's defined through the Bitcoin improvement process and is a uh, organizational and process-based uh, standards system. Then there is the reference implementation of the consensus rules, which is in Bitcoin Core, and that depends on the core developers and what is implemented in code uh, out of those standards becomes the reference implementation. And and then, then there's the runtime consensus. And runtime consensus is very different because a runtime consensus is what the network thinks the consensus rules are on the uh, highest difficulty chain at this moment. And sometimes uh, runtime consensus is different from what we think reference consensus is, sometimes because of bugs. Uh, so we found instances, for example, in April of 2013 when there was a very big fork. That was a, an example of where the runtime consensus differed from the assumed reference implementation uh, and caused some problems. Um, we've seen that occur again recently with um, BIP66, which caused another unanticipated fork. 
where the presumed reference implementation consensus around, around who had implemented strict encoding of signatures in uh, Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 66 was not the same as what was actually happening on the network where we discovered that a lot of miners were doing what's called now SPV mining or unvalidated mining and therefore the runtime consensus rules as implemented differed slightly from the reference implementation. So how do you govern software that it has standards uh, in the old style that may be defined by standards bodies, a reference implementation with a group core of developers uh, which uh, uses the open source collaborative development model of governance and a runtime network uh, dependent set of consensus rules uh, w which may differ from what the core developers want, uh, especially now that we're seeing some differences of opinion there. So uh, I think we're going to see a hybrid model where all three governance models are used. You're going to see um, the traditional hierarchical governance model, you're going to see the open source governance model, and we're going to start seeing the emergence, uh, clarification, and refinement of a new governance model for consensus-sensitive software, uh, which is a completely new class of software, uh, and for which we have no uh, prior models to refer to. Uh, and so a lot of this is now discovery. Let's see if there are any questions in... Um, yeah, and if you want to flag some of the questions that we want to follow up on, uh, in the meantime, let's continue with these questions. Sean says, um, the individual or group that created Bitcoin used the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. What do you think were the advantages and disadvantages of using a pseudonym? Um, well, uh, very simply, the advantage of using a pseudonym uh, is that um, that uh, doing something as radical as, as Bitcoin in the current uh, geopolitical environment can be dangerous. Uh, it can be dangerous in a uh, free country like the United States. It, it can be much, much more dangerous in other countries. Um, and so depending on where Satoshi Nakamoto lives or lived or the group of people who are Satoshi Nakamoto live uh, and uh, depending on what laws they fell under, uh, they could find themselves uh, under enormous pressure by uh, governments. Um, they could get sued, they could get jailed, they could get uh, prosecuted maliciously. Um, and so there's all kinds of risks involved in creating software that threatens one of the most powerful industries in the world, banking, and threatens government control of currency. So um, the advantage of using a pseudonym is that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto is not being maliciously prosecuted by half a dozen governments around the world. Also the advantage of using a pseudonym is that the media is not writing endless stories uh, trying to to smear Satoshi Nakamoto as a radical deviant uh, uh, pedophile terrorists uh, and whatever else you want to add on there, which undoubtedly um, many media organizations would have done, uh, especially if uh, uh, incentivized by people who had malicious reasons to smear Satoshi Nakamoto. So um, the advantage of using a pseudonym is also an advantage for Bitcoin because it doesn't allow Bitcoin to be smeared by association through whatever character failings, real or imagined, may exist in Satoshi Nakamoto. The disadvantage of using a, a, a pseudonym, of course, is that um, there's a lot of interest in finding out who Satoshi Nakamoto is. And a lot of people who don't understand decentralized consensus-based algorithms have this nagging question. Who is Satoshi Nakamoto? What are the uh, interests, incentives, and motivations of Satoshi Nakamoto, and what kind of control does this mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto have over Bitcoin? And no matter how many times you say um, no control whatsoever, that question comes up again and again because uh, this is the first time we've had a decentralized consensus-based uh, currency. So that's the disadvantage of using a pseudonym. 
All right, let's say, uh, let's look at some of the questions in the forum and I'll start answering those. Um, Gunnar asks, uh, can I explain mining? Um, not in this session. Uh, yes, we will be explaining mining. There is a whole section on mining. It's not something that can be explained in a few minutes. Uh, it, ha it will have an entire section, or in fact, I think two sections devoted entirely to mining, and we're going to revisit it many times in the future. For now, um, mining is a competitive process uh, that certain participants in the Bitcoin network uh, conduct every 10 minutes, and this competitive process is used to secure the network by validating all of the transactions that are introduced into the Bitcoin network in a way that doesn't give anyone power and decentralizing the function of validation uh, among all of these participants. A uh, side effect of mining is that in order to ensure the security of the network, the participants in mining are rewarded through the creation of new Bitcoin uh, and also through transaction fees. So uh, mining is essentially a delicate balance, an equilibrium between providing security for the network and if that security is correct uh, by the rules of consensus, receiving a reward. Uh, and that delicate balance provides the security for the entire network. Neil asks, uh, who undertook the stress testing? Um, and the answer is, we don't know. Uh, we do know some of the people who talked about it, uh, but it is impossible to really know uh, who is introducing transactions into the Bitcoin network. Uh, it's impossible to know um, uh, where those transactions really came from. Uh, and uh, unless there are hints in the transactions themselves, uh, or you do some kind of forensic analysis, or you look at statistical correlation between addresses, you really can't tell. So we don't know who did the stress testing. Anyone can do the stress testing. You can download a, a script that creates thousands of transactions with small fees uh, in order to uh, stress test the network. Ati asks, uh, can someone with motivation and resources to implement permanent and painful stress tests slow down the network permanently? Uh, yes, uh, that would not be a stress test. That would be called a denial of service attack. Uh, probably because it was distributed, it would be called a distributed denial of service attack or DDoS, uh, D-D-O-S as the acronym is, is known. And uh, the Bitcoin network can in fact be uh, attacked through distributed denial of service. There are many ways to do that. The difference with a stress test, keep in mind, is that these are transactions that are valid uh, and these are transactions that for the most part carried a small fee. Uh, the network is designed so as to ignore transactions that do not carry a fee if uh, these transactions, uh, if there are many of these transactions and they can't be fit into a block. Uh, and, uh, in fact, uh, additional measures were introduced in order to reduce the impact of very low fee transactions uh, during stress test times. So the network intelligently prioritizes transactions by fee, meaning that if you wanted to do an attack like this, you would have to pay fees, and the fees are essentially a measure to prevent exactly this kind of spamming or denial of service attack against the network. Fees are really uh, a way of controlling demand in order to uh, protect against uh, these attacks. So uh, conducting an attack like this costs money. It costs, um, you know, a significant money per hour to sustain an attack like this. And if someone was motivated enough to spend that kind of money on the network, uh, they would be able to sustain this attack. How effective would it be at disrupting Bitcoin? Probably um, somewhat effective at first, and then gradually over time, the Bitcoin network would adjust and adapt. It would provide motivation and, in fact, fees uh, to motivate people to scale up the systems to handle these transactions. And, uh, and as a result, it would likely be less effective and less effective and less effective over time until it wasn't very effective at all, but it would still cost a lot of money to run. Uh, so that's the kind of attack that has diminishing returns, 
uh, a diminishing impact on the network and costs a lot of money to run, uh, we can take that kind of attack. Um, it's not a problem. Parth asks, how would a private blockchain that some of the big banks are developing and exploring solve the Byzantine journals problem? Um, private blockchains, uh, or as they are known, permissioned ledgers, uh, do not uh, attempt to solve the Byzantine journals problems through uh, consensus algorithms such as mining, but instead, usually, implement a uh, distributed mechanism of signing, uh, signing rather than mining, meaning that um, known participants in the network uh, sign transactions into blocks uh, with digital signatures instead of providing proof of work behind their blocks. I essentially, you're talking about a closed ecosystem of, of known miners who, instead of using proof of work, use digital signatures. And let's say you had 10 banks participating in a private blockchain, and they were all participating in this blockchain, then they would implement a system where each block they take turns um, signing for transactions in the block. Uh, consensus algorithms to do that have existed for quite a while. So, for example, modified Paxos or Byzantine Paxos, as they're known, P-A-X-O-S. Paxos is a uh, consensus um, synchronization algorithm. Uh, also, you may have known it uh, as its previous variant called three-phase commit. It's a mechanism for coordinating resources in a distributed system. Uh, Two-phase commit, three-phase commit, Paxos, Byzantine, Paxos, all of these are various mechanisms that do not use proof of work, uh, but instead use a rotating leader uh, in a distributed network uh, and the leaders take turns uh, validating and signing for transactions in the block. So you could use an algorithm like that. It would, it would mean that you don't need any mining equipment. It would mean that you don't need any proof of work. Uh, but it would be a closed network with specific miners. And uh, it requires you to trust these miners to validate the network correctly. Now, uh, if you look at it from the perspective of, say, 10 big banks trying to use this to do settlement of transactions, um, this is an improvement over trusting a single provider to do this. Uh, for example, trusting uh, a company like uh, Bricks or uh, Depository Trust uh, Clearing Corporation or Swift or somebody like that, a clearinghouse, uh, and instead taking the role of the clearinghouse and splitting it between 10 of the major market participants uh, would provide with a more decentralized approach than a single point of failure, uh, but not the same as the completely open, completely decentralized uh, open blockchain that Bitcoin uses. Was the recent uh, stress test an attempt to sway maximum block size debate one way or another, asks Simon. Um, well, I mean, that would, uh, that would require me to guess the motivations of the people involved in the stress test. And I, what I can say is probably from what I've read, the motivations were varied. Um, I'm sure some people wanted to sway the debate. Uh, some people wanted to simply find out how the network would respond. Uh, some people wanted to test various wallets um, and various services that depend on Bitcoin to see how they would react to a massively increased pool of outstanding unconfirmed transactions, a mempool increase. Um, and so different parties doing these stress tests may have had different uh, motivations. Uh, I'm, I know that some of the people involved in this stress test did want to sway the maximum block size debate by demonstrating what happens when the network is under stress. Uh, I don't think that really the stress test swayed the network one, <coughs> one way or another. 
Uh, Simon has a follow-up question about centralized uh, private blockchains. Could you touch on the thinking behind private blockchains such as Bankchain being created by Citibank? One would think that in a high-trust environment, Byzantine General's problem does not apply and a traditional centralized database would suffice. Um, well, arguably, as I mentioned before, the differences between trusting a single participant, such as a clearinghouse, versus trusting uh, a number of different participants who are uh, acting as guardians of the consensus algorithm through signing. But again, you know, the, the real challenge with these solutions is that if you can hack uh, one of these participants or several of these participants, you can subvert the, um, you can subvert the system. And because it's not decentralized enough, it's only partially decentralized or it's partially centralized, uh, that means that it has uh, concentrated risk in the uh, in the parties that are trusted to validate transactions, and if those parties are subverted, uh, bad things can happen. Now, this may be a slightly less concentrated risk than having a single clearinghouse, uh, but you know that also comes with a downside, which is the speed of processing transactions and the efficiency. So the question is: It worth? Um, the performance overheads in order to slightly decrease the risk of concentration of control in a single clearinghouse. Uh, Bitcoin answers that question by saying, if you decentralize the risk completely, then that benefit in itself is so large, the benefit of decentralization and diffusing the control broadly, that it's worth the overhead penalty uh, because it allows you to create a completely peer-to-peer -peer open decentralized network. Um, the banks are saying, well, maybe it's worth some of the overheads to reduce the risk somewhat, but again, that will not give you uh, a peer-to-peer -peer and open decentralized uh, system. So um, whether that works or not uh, is remains to be seen. I, I personally believe that while this will have limited applicability and usefulness and can reduce costs within the banking environment, um, it doesn't offer any of the really significant and really important benefits of a completely open, global, decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer system such as Bitcoin's blockchain. It's a pale, um, essentially, it's a, it's a pale imitation. Now, um, a great way to think about this is like the difference between the internet and a corporate intranet. Uh, is a corporate intranet useful for publishing information internally within a company, for disseminating information and collaborating securely, uh, does it strike the right balance between um, security and openness? And does it offer benefits to companies that deploy intranets? Sure, it does. Um, although what we've seen is uh, many companies have, uh, in fact, taken on the idea that using the open internet to do collaboration, even on internal projects, uh, scales better and produces better results in terms of productivity, transparency, um, and um, as a result, uh, we see many companies using uh, GitHub to do their internal projects and using uh, open collaborative uh, software on the internet to do their internal stuff because the, the penalty that you get by closing your internet is, is greater than the security benefit. And so, as a result, uh, intranets are useful, but you know they're not really uh, groundbreaking or revolutionary or changing the world. Uh, they're just paler versions of the intranet uh, that are closed and limited in function. And inevitably, if you have an intranet, you probably need to connect to the intranet in order to collaborate with other companies that have intranets. I think the same thing applies to private blockchains. A private blockchain can be useful internally. Um, inevitably, you will probably need a public open blockchain in order to connect all of the little private blockchains. And there are many, many, many benefits that come from being on the global pu public blockchain uh, that you can't get on a private blockchain. So it has limited uh, applicability. Uh, Parth has a follow-up question uh, and asks, the fees are pretty limited. 
though. Um, and really, Parth is referring to the use of private blockchains. They don't have to be any fees. Uh, and, and a private blockchain can run with zero fees. Um, zero fees, zero mining costs, zero reward, uh, no new coin creation. Um, you can have a minimal currency that you use simply uh, in order to prevent spamming the blockchain if you want, but you don't even need to do that. Uh, and so, therefore, private blockchain could effectively be free to use. Essentially, all of the validation function is subsidized by the participants. And uh, there, there might be no fees to use a private blockchain by those who are allowed to use the private blockchain. David asks, is there something to prevent political influence or corruption within the core development team once the value of the Bitcoin network increases considerably in the future? Um, there's nothing to prevent political influence or corruption within any human organization. However, whether that uh, political influence and corruption can translate into actions that are damaging or divergent from the core principles of Bitcoin, uh, by changes to the code is a whole lot of question altogether. Um, if the core development team makes changes to the code, that doesn't mean that uh, anybody adopts those changes. They may not. Uh, and if those changes were egregious violations of the core principles of Bitcoin, arguably nobody would adopt them. And uh, very quickly, um, alternatives would be built and the code would get forked. So the threat of a fork uh, the ability for any participants in the Bitcoin network to run whatever software they choose, the scrutiny that comes from everybody watching all of the changes that happen in the Bitcoin core software, and also watching all of the discussions that happen as to why those changes are being made, um, provides for uh, some significant accountability and provides for checks and balances. So um, there are thousands of people who are paying very close attention to every line of code that goes into Bitcoin Core and are paying attention to all of the conversations and discussions and pull requests and patches that are happening on Bitcoin Core. And therefore, such political influence or corruption would really not be very effective in, in changing the code because, um, because those changes would be visible to everyone. All right, I think we've covered all of the questions. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Parth, your last question, is this what companies like Digital Asset Holdings are working towards? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, I don't know if that's a specific company that you're referring to or a type of company, so I can't really answer that question, sorry. If private blockchains are attempts to limit decentralization, could they replace the role that is traditionally played by bank regulators and auditors? Um, that's a great question from Simon. Um, so private blockchains are not attempts to limit decentralization. They're attempts to increase decentralization from a status quo of uh, one clearinghouse. To go from one clearinghouse to five is an increase in decentralization. Um, the difference is that Bitcoin went from one clearinghouse to thousands of clearinghouses through the uh, mining algorithm. So it's more centralized than Bitcoin, but much less centralized than the alternative that banks use today. Will that play a, a role in changing the way audit uh, and regulation happens? Probably. Uh, I think what it will do is it will provide uh, a much more transparent audit trail um, that regulators and auditors can use to inspect uh, the inner workings of markets. I don't know how much visibility regulators have into the order book and execution engine of NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange or uh, private exchanges like that, but if those um, used blockchain technologies, arguably that would provide increased uh, transparency. <laughs>
All right, let's see if we have any final questions or clarifications. Otherwise, we'll be wrapping up uh, this session. If you have any more questions, please drop them in the chat room and we'll take a look. Well, we've got some uh, slightly off-topic questions here. I'm not sure um, whether we can uh, address them. We're going to be discussing a uh, bit license in the regulatory uh, session, so we'll push that question back. Uh, Marcus, could you uh, extrapolate a bit on what you mean by that question? And if anybody has any more questions that I didn't cover, uh, now's the time. Please drop them in the chat room. Ah, yes. Uh, Marcus asks, does Bitcoin have a vision problem? Um, and then uh, clarifies, Bitcoin is a payment system versus a store of value um, and um, a predetermined vision, a predetermined destiny is something that happens in centrally planned economies and uh, centrally controlled currencies. So um, perhaps the Fed has a vision on what the US dollar should be uh, and arguably other central banks do. Uh, but Bitcoin doesn't work like that. And so whose vision? Uh, is the real question. And uh, Bitcoin has this, um, you can call it a flaw or you can call it an advantage, it depends on how you see it, but uh, Bitcoin expresses the interests and priorities of the participants in the network. And so if people see Bitcoin and they see it as a store of value and use it as a store of value, uh, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If a lot of people use Bitcoin as a store of value, it becomes a store of value. And if people use Bitcoin as a means of exchange, it becomes a means of exchange. And um, we don't know yet if those two goals are contrary to each other. Uh, perhaps a single decentralized open currency can't effectively and practically fill both of those goals. Um, maybe there are other goals. Maybe the concept of store value and exchange of value comes from traditional currencies and uh, perhaps the Bitcoin ecosystem as it develops in the future uh, with uh, payment channels and side chains and God knows what else comes along uh, really creates completely new classes of currency and assets that uh, fill multiple roles of exchange of value and store of value and other characteristics. And, and, and we are simply trying to use obsolete tools to do the analysis or understand what Bitcoin really is. And Bitcoin is whatever you make it to be, and that's really the bottom line. So maybe Bitcoin becomes a store of value, maybe it becomes a means of exchange, maybe it becomes both. Uh, we won't know that. And nobody is guiding the development of that because nobody is in charge of guiding the development of that, and that's a good thing. Now, um, I think the network will find a niche. This is a dynamic evolutionary environment. And I think of Bitcoin as a species that is evolving in an environmental niche. And maybe it will evolve into an environmental niche where it is better suited, uh, fit, if you like, in evolutionary terms for being a store of value, or maybe Bitcoin will evolve to be a means of exchange, or maybe uh, Bitcoin will evolve to be a platypus, a cross between a beaver and a duck, and it doesn't fit in any traditional category, um, and it fills both roles at the same time. Um, so we don't know yet, and watching the evolution of this system, uh, the evolution of the technology, the evolution of the community and the evolution of the economy, uh, all three of those components playing into each other. And uh, over time, we'll see what niche it falls into. Uh, 
if it falls into any niche and how wide or narrow that niche might be in terms of its evolution. Uh, but there is no vision because there is no, uh, essentially there's no intelligent creator, even Satoshi Nakamoto um, expounded on a broad vision which had Bitcoin play both roles and yet uh, even Satoshi Nakamoto cannot or could not control where Bitcoin ends up. Nobody can. And so no matter what the core developers say or pundits say or um, any one of the users or user communities within Bitcoin say, nobody can know exactly what niche Bitcoin will fill until it does. Um, so I won't have to address the independence of cyberspace question. I think that's a bit off topic for today's comments. Um, but I might pick it up offline in the forum. Uh, Simon asks a follow up. Could we say there's a continuous scale between fully centralized and fully decentralized? Uh, such as Bitcoin and each system has a place based on trust requirements. Trust in a single entity versus completely uh, trustless environment. I don't like the word trustless. I would say decentralized trust environment, uh, such as Bitcoin is trying to fill. Yes, it is a continuum. Um, what's interesting uh, to me is the scale invariance of that continuum, meaning that um, if you are 95% decentralized, it is not the same as being 95% central, centralized. Meaning that uh, things are very different on the two ends of that scale. Uh, let me give you a simple example. Uh, let's say you have um, uh, Wembley Stadium in England and it has a hundred doors and um, you have everybody go through one door where you have careful ticket control. It's a hundred percent centralized and the alternative is you have everybody go through 100 doors with no ticket control whatsoever, completely decentralized. Um, those are the two extremes. But what happens at the edges? So the situation where you have 100 doors and 90 of them have ticket control is very different from the situation where you have 100 doors and 90 of them are open. Because if you have 100 doors and 90 of them have ticket control, but 10 of them are open. Effectively, the stadium is open uh, because anybody who wants to get in can just go to one of the 10 doors that are open and bypass ticket control altogether. And if you have 90 of the doors open and 10 of them ticketed, then effectively the stadium is open. In fact, at any moment in time, you go from 100% ticketed to even 1% open. Uh, effectively the stadium becomes completely open because everyone can pick the one out of the hundred doors that is open and go through there. Um, which means that the continuum, uh, the scale between fully centralized and fully decentralized is asymmetric. If you have a slight degree of decentralization, it actually creates much more openness. Centralization has to be absolute in order to achieve control. And if it's anything less than 100%, uh, the, the marginal loss of control is massive. Uh, a single open door uh, breaks down all of your control structure uh, if you open it up. Um, so the reason I say that is because if you have a continuous scale be between fully centralized and control and fully decentralized, 50% decentralized uh, is, is, is not half of the control. Uh, a 50% decentralized system still gives you almost all of the benefits of openness uh, because it breaks the ironclad control. Uh, you really need to have 100% centralization and control in order to retain control, uh, which is why even a small amount of decentralization has a very, very disproportionate impact in terms of the loss of control it causes and or the freedom it introduces to participants in the system.
uh, which is really interesting because the financial system depends on end-to-end 100% control in order to control the flow of transactions, to do things like uh, KYC and AML and things like that. And so uh, even if you introduce a tiny bit of decentralization, it disrupts that element of control very dramatically. Uh, and therefore, I'm comfortable uh, living along this scale from centralized to decentralized anywhere in the 80% towards the decentralized side, uh, even if it's not 100% decentralized. Uh, I think you get benefits the moment you introduce decentralization, the moment you introduce openness, uh, because that subverts total control. So that's my concept of scale. Uh, that was a great question, Marcus. Thank you. And with that, let's wrap up uh, session two of the Massively Open Online course for the Master's Degree of Digital Currencies at the University of Nicosia. I've been your host, Andreas Antonopoulos, and I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, at the next session. Uh, please, as always, ask questions in the forums in advance. Give me some material to prepare, and then uh, see you at the chat next time. Thanks for the great questions this time, and see you soon.